Hello, Zoe Sophie here, and I am back looking at Christmas in A Christmas Carol. Now, I've been speaking for quite a while, which is why I divided these videos up. And I talked about in the previous video, I looked at the steps for success, reading the question twice, giving yourself some thinking time, reading the extract carefully, which I did in my previous video. So if you haven't seen that, you should go back and watch that first. My mapping your ideas, which you'll see on this piece of paper, and then five, six, and seven, I've done on my own because obviously it's fun watching me write, but maybe not for that time. So just to recap on this one, number four, my mind map of ideas, obviously you'll be writing the thing, but I've done it on the computer just so you can see. So I've picked this extract on Christmas, starting with the extract, how does he present ideas about Christmas? So Christmas in the extract and the novel as a whole. So I'd have an introduction about why Dickens is writing a novella that has a key theme of Christmas. You've got to think about why he's setting it in that time. Why not Easter? That's religious too, right? But no, he's chosen Christmas. So it's the Victorian concept of Christmas and Christmas being a special time, Christmas being a time of peace, of goodwill to all men. A lot of those ideas um, have actually stemmed from Dickens' writing and the Victorian concept of Christmas. Um, but these all sort of form into this whole idea of being good to each other. Now, we know that Dickens wrote this whole novella with the main aim of trying to inspire and promote the well-being of the poor and inspire particularly the middle classes and the rich and the government and the church to step away from things like the poor laws and the treadmill, which are pretty horrible and quite grim. I mean, if you were poor, you ended up in a workhouse. So they are awful. Um, very, very bad places. So Dickens had a period of being poor. I mean, he was in a rich family, middle to middle class to, to quite comfortable, and he did get a, a very good education. But he had a period where his father was in a debtor's prison and he had to work for a living. And that, I think, really um, tainted his um, perception of the world. And he got to see how badly the poor were treated. Um, I think if you look into his life, he lived close or at least was exposed to seeing the poor, um, the poor being um, sent to the workhouse and what workhouses were like. So you need to have this context in mind and you'll see that I put it together in the next uh, Word document that I'll show you. But I would put context here. OK, it says how he presents ideas about Christmas, Christmas being a good time. For what end? So that we could all be kind to each other, including the poor. That's my argument. And you need to go into the exam having your arguments in your mind already so that whenever you're asked, you've got some idea about it before you go in. You can leave a gap between paragraph one and two because you'll probably write it and then you'll come to the end. And you'll be like, oh, do I want to put my key techniques? So the way he presents it. Christmas in the conclusion or the introduction. You can do it either way. You can reference techniques here or in the conclusion or both. Okay. But if you're not sure what goes into a conclusion, I'll just put here, as I've kind of done here, reword the question with your answer. Um, you may want to mention some techniques. I'll change this font in a moment. And you need some context here, particularly for AO3. Uh, AQA wants context. Okay, so those would be my three things that I would put into an introduction. And I've color coded my worked answer so you can see how I've done that. Okay, paragraph two. So these are the peak paragraphs, which if you've um, seen my literature masterclass, if you've done my three day challenge, you'll see I've mentioned these point, evidence, technique, explain, and context. You don't have to put context in every single paragraph, but it's good not to forget about it. I think in my answer, I might have done another paragraph between five and six, because you've got to cover not just the extract they give you. So this one is stave three. You probably want to do a stave elsewhere or at least elsewhere within stave three, not just this bit, which we've read in the previous video. So I've put my quote here. Um, I've picked a technique. I think in the other slide, I color coded it blue. So I'm just keeping it up for consistency. Um, he sort of spirit, he's, he's sprinkling incense on them to be kind. I explain this, um, that I picked up an adjective. I think as I wrote it, I picked up other techniques as well, which all combine to create the effect that I um, wrote. So I think I put that even though the people evoke unkindness, the overall effect is, is of kindness. And then I had to think on my feet about other ideas here. So I think I took something somewhere from the Cratchit family. Oh, what a lovely pudding. 
something like that. And stay five where he sat down with Bob and Scrooge at the end. And they've got this um, smoking bishop, which if you don't know what that is, I looked at that as being symbolic and referencing Christmas. Smoking bishop, here you go. Ta da Doesn't that look nice? Think of mulled wine. If you don't know what that is, basically it's called smoked because you put the oranges in the oven, you smoke them, so they've got that smoky kind of burnt taste around the outsides of the orange, and then you chop it all up with the lemons, whole cloves, cinnamon, see cloves and cinnamon really sort of spices associated with Christmas, and the warm red red wine or mulled wine and it's obviously a very festive drink okay so again this connotes the warmth and, and sort of richness of christmas you wouldn't have this any other time but winter this is not a summer drink so think about things like that as well these are perceptive things maybe other people wouldn't notice and i picked up something else so i'm going to show you now i've obviously done steps five and six i've sequenced and i've written my response so i'm going to read it through for you so here we go Color coding, just for your aid, okay? This is my introduction. As you can see, there's a lot of context in here. There's only one bit of terminology which represents allegory um, is where you have a moral in mind. So he's moralizing a little bit here. And novella is just a short novel. Now in the exam, you'll see it says novel. Don't worry about it. It's technically a novella, which means less word count than a novel. But if you see novel in the exam, that's what it means. So I've written, as a Victorian writer profoundly affected, so profoundly means deeply, affected by the plight of the poor through personal and vicarious, that means experience through others, Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol with a keen, fervent agenda in mind. He wanted to promote the well-being of the poor through the creation of this allegorical novella, which seeks to change the minds of the well-off to become more charitable. And you're going to say to me, where's Christmas? I'm getting there. Christmas is a key theme. Oh, I should have colored theme like this. Look, see, because theme is also terminology, which Dickens uses to achieve this aim, promoting the poor, as it is associated with the time of kindness, charitable endeavor, um, reflection and family gatherings. So you've got to think about what you think of when you when you hear the word Christmas. These are the connotations. Arguably, it was Dickens's writing which contributed to the advocation, that means introduction of the Victorian concept of Christmas, highlighting to be an important time, one which employers, the state and the church ought to take active steps to help the less fortunate. So what have I done there? Like I said here, I've certainly oops, reworded my question. Yep, the bit in green. I've done the context. I haven't done the techniques yet. You can add, that's why I say leave a gap, because you want to work out wh which techniques you've used and where. I mean, look, I've got loads in this one. So I just think of the general ones. Okay, narrative perspective. Uh, that's uh, symbolic. It's a name which reflects someone's personality. So think of the Mr. Men books, Aptronyms, Mr. Tickles has long arms to tickle. Mr. Happy, he's got a perpetual smile on his face because he's happy. Um, Aptronym, Ghost of Christmas Present. With the present moment and he's a Christmas present, right? Um, adjectives, verbs. So I've got a lot of language devices in here, you can see. I've got the story itself, so the plot. A lot of symbolism going on. So I think in the end I did symbolism, characterization, language and plots. So I think I did my techniques. This got moved to conclusion. But it, it doesn't really matter as long as you put them somewhere, either conclusion or introduction. You can add a line if you think you ought to, but I've just got on with it. So I always leave a gap in the exam if I want to come back and add it. So these now are my Peter paragraphs, if you like, and I've, they're quite high level because I've got various techniques in them. There's a lot of green, so you can see I've, I've focused on Christmas. I focused on how Christmas is promoted. So that's the technique, and I've had to explain it. During the extract, readers note the behaviour of the second of the three expected ghosts, Christmas present, who visits Scrooge to aid his redemption. We know this already, but I'm just stating it so the examiner can follow what I'm saying. The ghost is portrayed as a jovial, although it's cheerful fellow, who advocates Christmas as a time for celebration, opulence and excess. Again, you need to know associations of Christmas to write an essay on it. In this scene, scene, oh, it feels like a scene, but it's not a scene. What is it? It is a stave. Naughty me, got that wrong. There you go. This is why we proofread. Okay, I'm really on the final step of proofreading it. The 
poor are passing by going about their business in preparation for the season. The spirit's response is reported to readers as the sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much for he stood and sprinkled incense on their dinners with his torch. Now I've talked about this in my previous video, which if you haven't watched, you should watch because I read the extract in detail and I give you my thoughts. And if you haven't got thoughts on the extract, you're going to struggle to actually turn those thoughts into an essay. I've then explained, clearly, this is somewhat focalized through Scrooge's perspective. What do I mean by that? Well, it's written in third person because it's that detached. Scrooge did this, he did that. It's not I. Okay, so it's third person. But you can see how Scrooge feels. There's a bit of focalization there. And if there wasn't, the writing would be way too detached for us to care. So focalized just means that despite it being a third person narrative perspective, we can still see it through Scrooge's view. We get his feelings come through what he's seeing in the form of the spirits and what they're doing. Okay, so it's thrown through Scrooge's interpretation. Arguably, the ghost is a symbol. See, I missed that too. That's more te terminology for kindness. And being named the ghost of Christmas present is telling. That means it's striking, it's notable. This atronym, I've explained what that already is, suitable name, frames the ghost as living in the moment, present, but also connotes gifts and giving, present. He is a gift in, in this example, as he sprinkles incense on the dinners, a representation for good cheer, that's the incense I mean, which clearly calms the conflict and instills happiness in the revelers. Do you remember in the extract where it says there were some angry words and a few drops of water and their good humor was restored directly? That's what I mean, okay? Indeed, it is declared to be a shame to quarrel on Christmas day. See, look here this bit, the end, so I'm joining it together. Highlighting, again, this is green because I'm linking back to Christmas. This day is so special, it is almost sacred. Both ghost and declaration, declaration would be terminology. I like the good intentions and best wishes of Christmas and in doing so advocates it as a time of virtue to Scrooge and the reader. So I think you're getting the idea that Christmas is elevated, it seems important time, that's the argument that's coming through here. Did I say that here earlier? Yeah. See? Keeping consistent. This is why I say leave a gap here, because you might write the thing and then write your argument near the end. Okay. Carrying on. As the extract continues, so I'm still on the extract. These paragraph two and three are all about the extracts. So start with the extract. As it continues, readers are exposed to the atmosphere triggered by the event of Christmas. It results in dinner parties and gatherings for togetherness. It states, and yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all these dinners and the progress of their cooking. Here, this bit. So I'm moving in order of it. I wanted to pick two examples. The use of the adjective genial connotes friendliness and kindness amongst residents and serves to contrast against the, I should put there earlier, pejorative phrase, angry words. Remember the bit where they're getting cross with each other? I pointed this out um, here. So you've got genial here and angry earlier. They're too far apart to be a juxtaposition, but you can argue there's a contrast. Against the earlier pejorative just means rude phrase, angry words, and the competitive verb jostle. So if you're jostling, you're competing with each other noted earlier in the passage and treated by the ghost of Christmas present with his symbolic incense. Clearly Christmas may reveal some tension between those dinner carriers who jostled each other, but the effect is opposite with those benefited by the ghost's actions resulting in a time of goodwill. In other words, Christmas comes along and all of the quarrel, you know, tension quarrels are soothed, smoothed over by Christmas. So again, highlighting it as a time of togetherness, a time of goodwill. Then I move on. Can't spend forever on the extract. Elsewhere in the novella, Christmas is highlighted as a positive time, most notably through the introduction of the ghost of Christmas present in stave three. So I've gone back a bit here. I don't usually like to do that, but I think this is important. Upon first introduction, he is described as a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn. That is a key quote. If you haven't learned that, do so. This vivid, that means so clear you could picture it, description using adjectives, giant, glorious, and glowing, combined to create a positive semantic field. That means a collection of words in which you can see a pattern emerge. So giant, glorious, glowing, they're all sort of positive. Um, luxury and warmth as well, I've linked them to. Clearly Dickens uses this ghost to represent the physical manifestation, that means creation, 
of the season in the novella, rendering, making him a compelling device. So he, the ghost himself is a technique. That's what I'm saying. Two, and I can always make that blue because technique, to persuade and influence Scrooge and readers because Scrooge, as well as the reader, are taken on this sort of journey. So if you've got a reader that agrees with Scrooge's views at the beginning or at least doesn't want to support the poor, Dickens is hoping to change hearts and minds by writing this to view Christmas as a special time. Then I put a context point. Now, you don't have to put context in everything. Look, I haven't put it in two and three, but I thought, oh, do you know what? I better put it here, draw it all together. This was important as the life of the poor was desolate. That means miserable and hard, meaning Christmas had to be different and offer them hope. So it was written for the poor too, to make them happier. The life of the poor, and I've done a nice little link here. So I want to write about something else. So I've linked it to, guess who? The Cratchits. The life of the poor is presented to the Cratchits who appreciate Christmas. Dickens uses these characters, so characterization, I think I name it here, yeah. Characters to educate and inspire Scrooge and the reader to value what they have, especially at Christmas time. Despite their abject, that means miserable or extreme, poverty and Tiny Tim's patent, that means obvious, illness, they are all eternally grateful for what they have. Bob Cratchit praises the food, oh, what a wonderful pudding, with exclamative affirmation. Rendered, made into positive tone, that means a good vibe, with the accompanying punctuation, look at that exclamation mark, of exclamation mark. Readers infer, that means work out, the meal is small, but the joy is large, denoting the warm celebratory affection Christmas brings. This family don't have a lot, but they gather together what they can because it's Christmas. And then I'm kind of getting to the point where I want to wrap this up because although I've got lots of time to write it, you haven't. So I've tried to keep myself writing to the sort of 40, uh, this is literature paper one AQA. You get about 50 minutes, but that's including proofreading time. So I don't want to spend too long. So I need to wrap this up. So I've sort of looked at stage five, what's happened by the end because of Christmas. It is therefore unsurprising to witness Scrooge's manifest, that means extreme redemption by stage five, which is elevated, made more powerful, by it occurring on Christmas Day itself. See, I didn't want to go off on a tangent here and write about Scrooge. This is about Christmas. The disruptive linear narrative, by this I mean, yes, it's in a kind of order, but I find it strange that it starts on Christmas Eve and then he has three visits and the time seems to go awry. And then when he wakes up, he doesn't know what time it is and he's delighted that it happens to be Christmas Day. So that's what I mean. Disruptive linear narrative of the novella, time seems suspended while Scrooge is visited by various ghosts, only serves to highlight the importance of December 25th even more. It is this novella and the traditions around it, which are immortalized, it means forever made. In this last chapter, or I could say stave, with Bob Cratchit promoted to dear friend and Scrooge to a second father, that's a quote to Tiny Tim. As Scrooge declares, we will discuss your affairs over a Christmas bowl, smoking bishop, make up the fires, readers experience the warmth and celebration of the season. A smoking bishop, I've explained this earlier, is a warm Christmas drink composing of smoked oranges and red wine, like mulled wine, and connotes all the festivity and spice of the festive period. It is again symbolic, I could underline that, lots of symbolism going on here. The change in Scrooge resulted in the narrative compliment he knew how to keep Christmas well. I've called that a narrative compliment because it's that third person, almost omniscient narrative perspective that has said that Scrooge knows how to keep Christmas. Right, I've got to wrap it up now. So in conclusion, use that because it makes it clear to the examiner you're, you're nearly finished. Clearly Christmas is presented by Dickens as a sacred time. So this sort of mirrors what I've said at the introduction. Okay, I have said key theme, time of kindness, charitable endeavor, reflection and family gatherings. Okay, so I want to mirror that in my, in my conclusion. Sacred time, one which must be kept honored and result in angry revelers being assuaged, that means soothed, so I'm referring to the, the extract they've given me. Symbolic comforts proffered, so I'm talking about the ghost's um, torch, I'm uh, talking about the horn of plenty, I'm talking about the smoking bishop. Kind words uttered, oh what a lovely pudding for example, and good Deeds, that should say deeds committed. So the good deeds of the ghost of Christmas himself, assuaging, soothing the angry revelers and, and Scrooge being kind to Bob. So you can see all of these are, these are examples I've raised in my essay. Dickens elevates, that means makes more powerful Christmas 
to heights of extreme reverence. That means it's almost exalted. It's almost seen with sort of religious significance in his allegorical novella using various literary techniques, which you should know by now because we've been talking about them. These are all things in blue. You don't need to name every single one, just the general gist. Most notably, symbolism, characterization, language and plot, the storyline. These combine to influence reader perception, that means point of view, of the time and instill, that means put in them, a sense of responsibility for one's fellow man, which perhaps explains why the novella is iconic, that means very well known, and loved at Christmas time. So a nice little context point there to finish it all off, draw it all together, but I'm still linking back to Christmas and why it's important and how Dickens presents it. But to know how Dickens presents it, you've got to understand why he's putting such value on it, why he set it on December 25th. Once you understand that, you can then follow the steps for success and create an essay like this. I will post this up for you to see as well. I hope this helps. Link to the essays in the comments below. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell to get notifications of when a new video has been released. And if you haven't already, you should watch this video first before the one you've just watched now. Thank you so much for watching my videos. I really appreciate it.